Welcome to Your Ghana, My Ghana. We're on Graphic Online TV and my name is Dede Amano Wilkes. Today we're discussing Professor Jeffrey Haynes' book, Revolution and Democracy in Ghana, The Politics of Jerry Rawlings. Our two distinguished guests joining me are Professor Jeffrey Haynes himself and Honorable Fritz Bafwa. Jeffrey Haynes is a renowned author and scholar specializing in African politics and democracy. His book offers unique insights into Ghana's political landscape. Fritz Bafour is a seasoned Ghanaian politician and journalist with extensive experience in governance and public policy. His expertise provides valuable context to our discussion. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Haynes, in your book, you've raised an interesting question quite near the beginning why Rawlings' revolutionary populism didn't develop the true democracy he envisaged. That effectively forced him to reinstate the multi-party democracy system, the multi-party political system he overthrew on 31st December 1981. Can you summarize for us the answer to your question? Thank you, Daddy. Well, my, my, I first came to Ghana in 1985 during what I believe was the tail end of the radical phase. And for the, last, for the previous two or three years, um, Jerry Rawlings had tried to introduce a, a system of what I might call popular power based on the People's Defence Committees and the Workers' Defence Committees. They were, I think, a good idea, but they were, um, they were poorly funded, they were poorly organised, and they didn't really have an ideological focus which was easily translatable into a viable political method of organization. I think that this was the this was the idealistic phase of the revolution when Jerry Rawlings believed that the passing power to the people would be the way that Ghana could progress given the period of failed democratically elected regimes and failed military based regimes. Um, I call it revolutionary populism because his, his appeal was very much to the ordinary working person, the man and woman in the street, so to speak. And he, he made the point, argued strongly, that they, they were the backbone of Ghana. They were the people who produced what Ghana needed to survive and thrive. They were the key um, elements of the society in, in his, in his um, view, I think. But given that the, the political methods he, was, he thought he could um, use, which is basically a spontaneous... Um, Development of a movement which would which would which would develop into a viable political system didn't really, I think, have the capacity to do that. It was a good idea, maybe, but didn't really have the mechanisms to 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 make it happen. So I, I think that over time, um, and Mr. Buffalo will know better than me, I'm sure, that, that Joey Rawlings was faced with a conundrum. How would he move on from the provisional? National Defence Council, which was always meant to be a short-term um, response, to a viable system of permanence, which would be based on a democratic uh, input from ordinary people. And I think given that the answers were the PDCs and the, and the WDCs, followed by the Committees for the Defence of the Revolution, um, they, they didn't prove to be a viable basis for a long-term democratic solution, I think. The other dimension to it was that, that, that Jerry Rawlings was regarded as a dangerous radical by Western governments. And as, um, as Ghana needed Western investment, Western loans, because there were no other sources of viable amounts of money coming from the Eastern Bloc or from, from potentially allied countries, they were able to pressurize him over time to think about how he would take, take, take things forward not in a revolutionary way, but in a way which would enable this, the country to develop in stability and security. Um, and as they held the financial whip hand, I'm afraid that they also held, to some degree, the political whip hand. There was also... And, but why did those funds dry up? At the beginning, there was also Gaddafi, wasn't there? Uh, was... Gaddafi never, to my knowledge, Gaddafi talked the talk, but he never walked the walk when it came to sums of money. Um, also, the world oil price dropped around about this that time, and, and, and Libya itself was 70. was facing some some pretty economically uh, difficult times. So the West had the had the whip hand. The, the opposition here grew in in prominence, 
and it grew in confidence. And by the mid to late 80s, I think, the, the dream of popular power that, that Jerry Rawlings uh, believed in was not viable. And he began, of course, with the district elections, uh, the district assemblies, which were not party-based. But this seemed to me to provide a momentum which inevitably led it seems now, in hindsight, inevitably led to the reintroduction of multi-party democracy, which, in the referendum prior to that to that re, uh, re, um, rebirth of democracy, something like ninety percent of Ghanaians voted for a multi-party system rather than a, any other kind of political system. So that's a long answer to a short question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And yet, um, in spite of that, you know, long, long answer to the short question, um, quite a long history of um, the movement from the radical phase, as you said, to multi-party a multi-party democracy system. Fritz Balfour, today as we're moving into the election towards, moving very rapidly now towards the elections, there seems to be this growing disenchantment with our political system. Um, do you think that there's some kind of nostalgia about the Rawlings period now? Well, there's always been um, some kind of nostalgia for Jerry Rawlings. Um, as soon as we started getting into deep into the democratic system, basically because we've got political parties and there's constant opposition of in terms of policies and things like that. Um, when you have um, a development that you want to um, uh, do and and you have opposition to it, it delays. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a strong man or uh, you know um, a strong party a uh, strong political machine and they want to have something done they do it yeah. without the opposition so yeah. there's nostalgia because roads are not being built and yeah. bridges are not being built and decisions are taking such a long time um, to be determined that's what brings the nostalgia yeah. um, and also um, uh, party politics is very expensive um, uh, endeavor, and it's 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 now being shown in everything that we do. Uh, people are now admitting that they're bribing the populace and the electorate, and and there's no they're there's bribing. A, yeah, bri yes, basically, mm -hmm. because when you mm -hmm. you 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 are inaugurating projects all over in various places to show that you've done something for the mm -hmm. people. So they've got to pay, they've got to vote for you because you're the one who deliver. And maybe the project that you've, you've brought into, into, into view is not something that is going to impact on the people per se, but it's happening in their location. Then you know that there's something absolutely wrong mm -hmm. there and then. So in terms of... Even the, the cost of registration. Cost of re registration. Now, yeah. Especially uh, at presidential. That's right. And... Um, Nobody's sure that um, even if you talk about the polling systems and things like that, people think that it can be upended mm -hmm. by um, rigging because money is being thrown left, mm -hmm. right, and center. Mm -hmm. So that dissatisfaction mm -hmm. with the political process is what brings about that nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And um, Jeffrey Haynes, part of the disenchantment of our electoral system today also, I believe, has to do with the inability increasingly to distinguish between the two major parties ideolo ideologically. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about ideology, ideology the revolutionary debates of that early radical period. Um, for example, the debates about the haves and the have-nots. Um, um, are we missing some of that spark in today's election debates? Well, I think the world has changed a lot in 50 years, in nearly 50 years. And I think that, that in, 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 in that period, globally, really, the, the, the political debate was about what I would call left versus right mm -hmm. uh, versus a conservative approach to politics against what I might call a, a leftist or more radical approach to politics. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem any longer to be um, the way that politics in Ghana and also elsewhere are conducted. Why would that be? Well... I think that, that there is disillusionment with, with, with ideological answers to practical questions. And I think that people now are much more interested in how they will pay the bills, how they will find a job, how they will 
find the practical means to have a good life. And the left-right debate didn't really um, concern itself too much with that. It was more about principles and practices and, and how um, change would be, would be uh, brought about. I, I think in Ghana that there is um, still an element of ideological difference. I would, from an outsider's point of view, I would certainly see the two main parties as somewhat different ideologically. I would certainly see the, the NDC as a more of a uh, party focused on social justice and equality and, and development concerns than the MPP, which seems to me to be more of a, a party more concerned with a sort of capitalist development model which I've seen myself in the in the United Kingdom, where where, where I uh, where I live, and it hasn't brought about much in the way of beneficial change. So I think there's still some spark of ideological distinction in the outcome, not only in the rhetoric. And in the outcome, yes, indeed, okay. indeed. All right. And Fritz Buffer, you served as MP for Ablikuma South for yeah. two terms, yes. 20, 2008 and 2012. Yes. I remember in 2012, there was a study that came out of the University of Ghana saying that only 5% of the electorate care about, vote on ideological grounds, yes. care about ideology. Why do you think ideolo ideology is no longer important as it was? Well, uh, I think that we, we also have to mention the, 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 um, the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. uh, when East and West sort of, and then the um, Soviet Union, which was the champion of the communist ideas and the left, all sort of watered down and became, um, they called it social democracy, but we found big instances of capitalist development in, in, in the Soviet Union, China, which was also uh, supposed to be a very leftist country, became the, you know, the workhouse of the, of the world right. and, and trade and all these things came in and, and all that. And it affected us too, because um, what are the models that you're going to use for reference? Mm -hmm. Um, in terms because of the models that you mentioned in your book that Jerry Rawlings was interested in, you talked about three countries, Mozambique, Libya, and Cuba. Cuba, Cuba. Cuba yeah. Mozambique. Well, Libya. you know, I mean, I'm a great admirer of Cuba. Mozambique also mm -hmm. went, um, you know, pear-shaped. Per uh, Libya, you know, the death of, um, Gaddafi. of Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. um, Cuba has always been the example. And one, one thing we hold up high when we're the leftists when we talk about Cuba is that America has been very unfair to, to mm -hmm. Cuba in terms of the embargo. So Cuba could be 10 times better mm -hmm. as a socialist nation if America had raised them, uh, lifted the embargo and all that. So that gives us hope. So we look at Cuba and then we have also have the influence of um, Cuba on our educational system where we've had trained doctors, the doc they came here and the work that they did in, in Angola in making sure that Angola became a free nation. So these things can come come to the fore. So when and you the want island to, of youth, that yes, was, the island of youth, which is uh, you Ghanian know, Ghanaian children were sent to Cuba and, to and they, school they've, on the island. They've of done youth. extremely well. You've got doctors and mm -hmm. and uh, engineers all working in different places, and and we cite them as perfect examples of patriots because they go everywhere. You send them; most of them do, because they saw what happened in Cuba, but. Um, Again, I think ideology is something that is also uh, thought and disseminated. And I don't think that um, our educational system mm. uh, disseminates enough uh, information about the ideological changes. So more what you said about the NDC and the MPP, it's true. Uh, the MPP, its, its origins are um, from the property owning democracy and now they profess it. Um, the NDC that doesn't talk about the property owning de democracy. It also talks about delivering to the man on the street. And I'll give you an example. Um, there was this affordable housing um, project in, in the Adai area, which was almost finished. And when the MPP came into power, they just said, well, there was corruption. So they decided to abrogate the contract. The, the, the buildings were almost done. The apartments were almost done. And they just said, forget it. Now the, the, the whole thing is, is gone. It's, it's now a, uh, is it a war zone. big development you see on yes, the left yes, as you're driving towards Adana yes. and there's nothing yes, been happening uh, yeah. there for the last few years? And it was finished, it was almost 95% mm -hmm. finished. Painted. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that if, they were, if the MPP were, were oriented, to, oriented towards the 
a man on the street, they would have said, okay, it's finished so that we'll find a way of making sure that people live in it. But they just stood there and let the whole thing go to ruin. And now they want to sell the project. I'm, I'm, I'm not citing the, the, the negatives, but I'm just saying that when you look at the reasons and the result to deter that were used for that, two different ideas. Now, what the MPP wants to do is to sell it to a private investor for him to do, to, to, to come up I with, see. so, you know. So it happens. And then in terms of farming and, and everything, uh, I think that the NDC was more result oriented. The MPP is more about, yes, we've done this, see it. And um, even if you don't feel it now, it's a good thing. <laughs> but is that not the example you cite, that housing development, is that not a case um, does that not strengthen the argument that Rawlings made that multi-party democracy is not, is, doesn't really serve the interests of the people? Because now you have. Well, well. And well, that's a common example. Well, a I'm a, I, I, I also have uh, that kind of inclination. Uh-huh. Um, you do? I do. And I, I mean, after serving for eight years? Yes, I served for eight years because saw? that was the system that was in place and that was mm -hmm. what I could work in mm -hmm. within, you know. Um, but if I look at the 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 the, the the process to independence and that before you can get a nation together you've got to get rid of tribalism you've got to have one nation and all that kind of thing but when it comes down to party politics in those days it became a ethnocentric and then they created a problem and there were divisions and things like that so in 1965 uh, Kwame Nkrumah had a one-party state mm -hmm. okay unfortunately there were all kinds of influences and things against him and it didn't work. And I just felt that in the time from 1986 to 1992, the positive developments in infrastructure and in policies that, that were bulldozed through by the PNDC, mm -hmm. right? Because of state autonomy. The state autonomy. Mm -hmm. And then there was some kind of autocracy too, because mm -hmm. if a decision was made, who there was no real opposition. Mm -hmm. But you also have to look at the, uh, the, 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 the other side of the story, that it's not everything that the PNDC did that was right, and you needed somebody to uh, rail against it and say that, no, listen, this is wrong, but, but did you have the capacity and the capability to do that? And so that is the, 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 the other side of it when we come to talk about... But then uh, do you politics. liken that potential to what happened with the East Asian Tigers, for example? Because of state economy, they could railroad things. Yes. And developments were. happened very rapidly. I know a lot of Ghanaian sites, Malaysia, and they cite Malaysia, Singapore. Singapore, but, but, Taiwan, but South But there, there, but there, are, other, there are other influences that people don't take into consideration. You had the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And the Vietnam War, a lot of money was wasted. Billions were wasted that went di did not directly impact the war. And that money went into the, the, yeah, uh, Asia. I mean, it was used and, and they must have found a way of using those resources for their betterment. And the fact that there was a war and it was a war based on the Cold War meant that Americans needed to put investments or the West needed to put investments in those areas to protect um, um, what they wanted to do, that they needed allies. You know, so we, we have to take that into consideration. I know people talk about Singapore. Singapore is an island. Um, uh, Malaysia um, had its problems with the uh, communist insurrection in the 50s. The British went in there and they spent a lot of money to prevent that from happening. We haven't had that. You know. So, you know, when we talk about it, we have to look at the historical connotations and things like that. And do you, uh, you do make that point, Jeffrey, that... Um Rawlings was, he read the writing on the wall, that's why he had to restore multi-party democracy, because his, the, the institutions, the, the defense committee didn't take root, but then he didn't get the kind of support that the East Asian Tiger economies got, because Japan had been def defeated in World War II, and the, and the West was, a, was worried about the advance of communism, yeah. and therefore they pumped a lot of money into, mm. is that the reason he was forced to go to the IMF, because he could Well, I would like to come into that backwards, as it were, uh -huh. and start with the East Asian Tigers, because the, the, the countries which, to use the term, bulldoze through development um, in the... I mean, it, it's not well known that South Korea and Ghana 
in the 50s, we're at the same level of development. With all exactly, same GDP. exactly the same GDP per right. capita. And now I think the, the gulf is, oh. is enormous. Mm -hmm. But one thing that, that more prosperity led to, certainly in Singapore and certainly in South Korea, is strong, and Hong Kong, was strong demands for democracy. So in a way, I think you can bulldoze these things through without democratic accountability. But then when people get the benefits of the bulldozing through, they then want democratic accountability. So I think it's a chicken and egg thing, really. Do you have democracy first and then development? Or do you have development first and then democracy? But the outcome seems to be the same, that people want both democracy and development at the same time. That's where the problem lies. I think Jerry Rawlings deserves a lot of credit for not going the way of some other, other political leaders in Africa and elsewhere by refusing to stand down. And I mean, there's... We all know we could list the African leaders that have been in power for 20, 30 years who, despite popular discontent, I'm thinking of Mozambique, for example, or Angola, there is no desire to hand over, no desire to step down because the consequences of stepping down for those in power is regarded to be intolerable. So I think Jerry Rollins deserves a great deal of credit, whether it was pragmatism, whether it was, it was anything else, to actually preside over a system where he asked the people what they wanted, people said multi-party multi democracy please, he then became elected president twice, served for eight years, didn't try and rewrite the constitution to stay in power for a third or fourth term, but then stood down and an election was held and an alternative was chosen by the people. So I think he deserves a great deal of credit and I, the word pragmatic is kind of a bit of a it's a bit sort of bland, really. I think it's a, the response of a thoughtful person who's, who, who, real, who realized that the way forward wasn't necessarily the way that he preferred, but he was prepared to go along with the popular choice. Um, but rightly or wrongly led to multi-party democracy in Ghana. And the final thing I'd say about that is that Ghana is recognized in Africa and much, much more widely as a beacon of stability, and um, democratic uh, ness, which other countries in the region do not share. And it's a great feather in Ghana's cap internationally to have this particular um, accolade. And it brings in investment because countries that are stable and secure and have a democratic system get much more investment than countries that are dictatorial or have a lot of instability and, uh, and political issues to do with a the failing political system. You spent a lot of time in your book analysing the differences between the revolutionary cadres, the organisations from which he drew some of his ideological yes. um, support. Yes. The NDs, the... Um, um, CDRs. Not the, the CDRs, the I'm GFM talking about the JFM, the June 4th oh, movement, and, and the NDM. And the New Democratic the Gen, Movement, yes. JF, the June 4th movement were the activists, the agitators. And then the, 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 the NDM were the ones they called the armchair revolution. Yes, yes, yes. How much of that pragmatism was due to their failure to unite um, together with the Kwame Nkrumah revolution in Ghana? Uh, yes, there was a, there was a, uh, there was a, suddenly there was like a mushrooming of radical groups. There was a mushrooming. But they couldn't unite ideologically. Well, yet they were let all. me add, there's a, lot of the, there's a lot of this material in the book because the book started life as a PhD thesis. Uh -huh. And you, you will know that PhD, you will know very well, you will know very well, sir, that PhD theses have to have that kind of detailed analysis of what some might see as fairly obscure issues. But um, for me, it's a very integral part of the whole story because my strong impression is that the leftist groups thought Jerry could be manipulated and used by each of the factions. And I particularly mentioned the GFM and NDM. And I think that the, the, the two left main leftist groups, and I, I would call them factions really, because they didn't have popular support. Mm -hmm. We're talking about mm -hmm. a few hundred activists at most, mostly based in the crowd, but not, not entirely. Um, maybe, maybe the exception was the, the work that somebody like Yao Graham did with the the workers in Tema. Yes, well, yeah, was an NDM yeah. man, of course. Yes. So, and whereas JFM were, were the ones who were JFM more was Krista Tim. It was it, it was a younger, much more radical group. And one of the problems of leftist politics, more generally, and you see this in almost every context, leftist groups don't get on. They find it hard to unite in a common cause because they want to have the revolution in in the way that they prefer to have the revolution. 
The JFM thought the NDM armchair revolutionaries, it meant that you weren't out on the streets, you weren't getting the people to, to, to demonstrate and be activists. But the NDM perhaps had the ideas which, which in the longer term were the ones that became much more relevant within the revolution than the JFM did. Because the JFM people, rightly or wrongly, were more or less airbrushed out of the picture quite early on. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did research for the book in the UK in the second half of the 80s, uh, as well as in Ghana. And there was many of the former leftist radicals living in London who were very, mm -hmm. very happy to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I got what I think was quite an insight into the, into the, uh, the issues of the, of the intra-leftist um, dispute, which I don't think Jerry had much time for. I think Jerry said, this is, this is not going to work, make the revolution work, no. talking about how to make the revolution work. Mm -hmm. We need to make the revolution work by practical action. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, although you're saying that it's because you're writing a thesis that you went into all that detail, it did stir a lot of memories. I remember those debates on campus yes, whenever you went to course, Legon, you know, course, that was, of course. You know, it was, and it was quite, it brought back sort of actually fond memories, because yes, it yes. did seem to be a time of ferment and anything was possible. Yes, yes, and absolutely. Everybody was very engaged in what yeah. kind of a political system we wanted. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Whereas it seems a lot more apathy today oh. and... And people are very disillusioned and don't know who to vote for, and because they don't expect much of a different outcome. Although you're, although you both believe that there are different outcomes from each of the two big parties. Potentially. Potentially, okay, potentially. So um, that's why I'm asking whether we're missing that spark that was there in those. Well, yes, we 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 we, we may miss the spark, the spark, but but as you point out, the um, many among the among the, among the young, we call them the young generation, are simply not interested in politics. Politics mm -hmm. has deliver to them a good life already, and certainly in some countries, and to some Ghanaians also. Why worry about anything else beyond your own your own personal interest? Whereas the Why worry about the other the other man? Why worry about the other, the other man? man? I'm all right, Jack. Uh -huh. You know? And um, Is that how you see it, Fritz? Um yes, in a way, um I think that we we also didn't handle um, the young, in terms with the young ones within the political firmament, mm -hmm. um, we didn't we didn't inculcate in them the values. We let them grow within the party that I belong to, a particular political party. And then mm -hmm. you made a deputy minister, or you made a minister, you made a political nabob, and then all of a sudden there you are. You are, you understand, and you achieved. Um, a certain position that one had to go through a long time in the old days. So, the, 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 yeah, the innate selfishness came in. Um, but, but what I want to say is that you're right. Uh, Jerry Rawlings wasn't really in a mode with uh, the multi-party system, and he said it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said it right so up to the times. time mm. he died. But um, uh, he thought that it hindered the um, uh, the... Um, provision of infrastructure mm -hmm. and the right kind of policies for the people because people just argued for the wrong reasons. And what he just said about the JFM and the NDM is true. Okay. Jerry didn't have time for the arguments the and everything debates. when you know that uh, people are dying of guinea worm and mm -hmm. it's avoidable and that bridges can be built and everything and people are arguing about all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Though it is necessary because you need political debate but not as part of um, the provision that government is going to give to its people. So he didn't have mm -hmm. too much time for it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, for when someone has been in power, as long as Jerry Rawlings yeah. was, it's perhaps not surprising that uh, a lot of falling out occur. Yeah. Um, you are Minister of Information under yeah. President Atta Mills, yeah. with whom Rawlings fell out. I believe you fell out with him at some point, but then you became close again. Before his, um, yeah, before it, his it, 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 uh, in our case, it was a bit of a personal thing that uh, you know it wasn't anything to do with the ideology or that it wasn't hatred. It was just that we sort of. <laughs> Can you tell part. us what happened and what lessons uh, we no, can draw? No, yeah, well, um, I think that when it comes to a very powerful person like Jerry Rawlings, you know. Um, he also relies on his intelligence on the intelligence reports he's getting from mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. sometimes um, misinformation would come in, and the verification process would create something like that. Mm -hmm. 
but in, in 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 reality, in the end, you know, whatever happened was he realized that it wasn't true, and we got back together, you know, and we got back together in a in a very um, in a far more intense way than even before, because now we took each other very very seriously. The the lightheartedness left it, and how are we going to solve? You you're you're a former MP or you're an MP? How are we going to deliver? Um, be part of parcel of the process, the actual process of delivering, and that's what came into came to the fore. So we discussed things that uh, you could see results at the end of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm a, a student of politics and history, and I know that even Kwame Nkrumah had great fallings out. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the people who became his very big opponents were very much part and parcel of the process at the beginning. We're talking about Joe Apia, we're talking about mm-hmm. Victor Usu, Onibakwa Richardson, they were all members of the CPP, but then as a result of political battles, personal infighting and everything, they left it. So that one I understand. But Jerry was, um, uh, he, he had his doubts about multi-party democracy and, and some of the things that he talked about are now coming out. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, uh, for example, we've now got a fight in in Parliament and it's where chairs were to sit and, and you know, when and he would have said, "Okay, you're fighting with chairs, and people are dying. We've got a we've got a situation in Boku, for example. I mean, we had the the Kunkuma Nanumba war at a certain time. He sent the the uh, forces there, and it was a well planned thing to make sure that people could get access to their farms. And that's what he looked at. It wasn't just about peace, but what are the benefits for the people in terms of the farms that they've got to go to." the impact of produce from the farms and the harvesting and all those things came to And he'd give that kind of uh, Because uh, he was very much a hands-on leader. Hands-on man. And he also believed in, he also believed in the consequences of, of certain political actions, especially the consequences that would emanate from uh, an intervention that would affect the man on the street. Because well, he was very was much... Was it a man. missed opportunity? Did Ghana waste Jerry Rawlings? Because is there a lot more we could have done with him <laughs> in terms of... Because when you look at, for instance, the, the evacuation of Coco, that was actually very... When you look at the Coco statistics, yeah. they, they peak under him. Yeah. They rise. And so yeah. there were some policies that were very effective, but Ghana wasn't getting the economic support, as you said, for yeah. various reasons. Yeah. Western donors didn't want to yeah. fund a radical government. Right. Did we somehow waste this opportunity to I, have I, a general park I, I, I think who that, would solve I, Ghana's problems? I think that I think uh, post rollings, we, we wasted his, mm-hmm. his uh, abilities and his capabilities. All we were listening for, especially the media, was for the boom speeches. Mm-hmm. That he would entertainment, com- entertainment. Uh-huh. yeah, more so, and then mm-hmm. they would laugh and say, "What a wonderful man!" But he was more serious than that, more mm-hmm. intense than that. He was saying that. I remember when he came and he spoke about. Um, he warned the NDC about that we should not follow the MPP because they were better at what they did than if if we tried. All right, I mean, that's the kind of mentality he had. That if be true to yourself. And being true to yourself as the NDC is be true to the man on the street who is supposed to be the, 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 the target audience for whatever policies that you have. Um, I also believe that we made a mistake when we had we got a hybrid system mm-hmm. in Parliament where the executive, executive doesn't have, uh, the legislature doesn't have real oversight over the executive. Because he selects the executive tech selects the majority of his uh, ministers from parliament, and so people will police the gallery to be appointed. And if we look at um, the social perceptions of who's a minister and who's an MP in terms of salaries, the different there's a very li- little difference. Mm-hmm. But people will defer to a minister rather than to an MP mm-hmm. because they believe that the minister, minister can do power. wonderful things. Uh-huh. But then again, when you look at the political structure, the the district uh, chief executive is actually the spending power. In in reality, within a a particular area or location, he he should be more influential than the MP because the MP is going to be a legislature and all that. But the perception is that the MP is even more powerful than the DC. So there are DCs who want to be MPs. But very few MPs want to be DCs. Right. But when we're it talking like about spending, yeah, but so, they have the budget. Yeah, 
because they have the budget. But in other countries, yes, I'd want to be a DC, I want to be a mayor, that kind of thing. So we've got a lot of things that we've got to do in looking at the review of our constitution. And I'm sure that Jerry Rawlings would have been very interested in that. And if we'd done the review of the constitution, it was a wonderful review done by the Fiajo Commission um, in, the, in, in 2012. And I was responsible for the dissemination the review went around the whole country and everything, and people loved it. But then, the, I think the powers that be realized that there's a lot of power in the present state of the Constitution, so they, they, they're they very, very, very reluctant to change the, the status quo. So, yes, we're a multi-party democratic, uh, democracy, but we have to fine-tune our, our Constitution and look at, at things, and then we'll see it really from the, the point of view of where Jerry Rawlings was coming from. Too many fights, too many, you know, water, water uh, battles and things like that, when we have got incredible things that we've got to do for this country. Mm. And finally, Jeffrey, you're here in Ghana to launch the Ghana version of your book. Yes. You started working on Ghana more than 30 years ago. It, nearly 40, actually. Nearly 40 years yes. ago. Why does this all matter to you? That's a very good question. Sometimes, sometimes I sit in my hotel room, uh, 3,000 miles away from my family, and think, why am I doing this? <laughs> well, um, I'm an academic, and I've spent the last 40 years writing about um, politics in general, African politics, religion and politics. I guess it's in the blood to some extent, and I'm sure Buffalo will... Will, Mr. Buffer, will, 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 will know what I'm talking about. When you, once you start writing about things, when you start being interested in things, you carry on regardless. But why specifically Ghana? Well, that's I'm, I'm always asked this question. Mm -hmm. I have no uh, no roots in Ghana. I have no links to Ghana. I have no you know colonial skeletons in my cupboard <laughs> regarding Ghana, <laughs> which I'm pleased to say. Um, no, it, it, it's, it's very mundane, actually. I, I, I completed a degree in, in, in international studies in uh, 1983, and um, I went straight to do a PhD, and I was very interested in, uh, in, in, in politics, in what we now call the Global South. And um, I had a, a, a tutor, a Mr. Stephen Riley, who was a very eminent... Uh, eminent uh, scholar on Sierra Leone, also in West Africa, of course. And uh, Stephen said, well, you know, there's something happening in, in Ghana, which is almost next door to Sierra Leone, something happening with a man called Jerry Rawlings. He's um, bringing some new ideas. He's, he's taken power by coup d'etat. Nothing new there. But the ideas that he's talking about, the ideas he wants to implement, look quite interesting. So a coup with a difference. And I thought, okay. And... There is a pragmatic reason. Ghana is an English-speaking country. I'm not a linguist. Um, there was interesting things happening in Upper Volta, Burkina Faso. Yeah. But I'm not a French speaker, and I thought, how difficult would it be to do research in a country where I can't speak the language? So it was, so it was Ghana. It was partly the times. The world was, world was on fire. There was radicalism in the air. African countries were looking to a new future and a new, new, new model. It was the enthusiasm of my, um, my, who became my friend and colleague, Mr. Stephen Riley. It was my own idealism about finding out about a, a system which appeared to buck the trend of the normal, mundane political systems, especially in Europe, in the US. So I found myself one day in June 1985, at the air, uh, um, getting off the airplane at Kotoka, thinking, my goodness, it's hot today here, isn't it? It's very humid not realizing my first trip to, to tropical Africa, that's what it was like every day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I stayed here for four or five months. I was um, welcomed by the um, political science department at Legon. It was Dr. Kwame Ninsen who was, yes, the, yeah. who was the, um, my key interlocutor in those days. And I had a great time. I learned a lot, missed my family a lot. But I came away with a myriad of interesting material which fueled the PhD. I passed the PhD in 1988, um, went on the back burner, and then I moved away from focusing on Ghana. And then in November 2020, when, when Jerry Rawlings passed, I got several calls from Ghana saying, would I like to comment? I said, well, you know, why me? I, I, I haven't been to Ghana in 30 years. 
I haven't written about Ghana for 20 years. And they said, well, you know, some of the stuff you wrote in the past was fairly interesting and, you know, you, you may have an opinion. And um, so, yes, I did have an opinion and I think I was on a TV program and a radio program. Yeah. And then I thought, aha, well, I've never finished, never got my PhD published. Oh. But given that it was decades out of date, I thought, well, okay, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch a book proposal to a publisher, a Routledge in the UK, and... Um, the proposal will be to up update the uh, the story because nobody, in my view, has written about the the, the Williams period in anything like the detail and objectivity it requires. Mm. So I found myself 32 years later, again on the airport airport at Kotaka, not being surprised at the heat and the humidity <laughs> then. And um, I've now been back. I think this is my seventh time in two years. So. Because it's, because it's now in the blood. Well, I'm, I must say it's a very good read. It kept me Thank up you. all night. <laughs> in a good way, I hope. A very good read. No, it's fascinating. It brought back lots of memories. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for that. And I think this is a good place to bring this conversation to an end. And I thank you both for these very interesting perspectives you've Thank you, too. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for your thank sharing. You. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Your Ghana, My Ghana, and thank you all for joining us. My guests today have been Professor Jeffrey Haynes and Honourable Fritz Balfour, and I am Dede Amano Wiltz. Don't forget to subscribe to our Graphic Online YouTube channel and see you again next time. For more news, please visit our website graphic.com.gh or follow us on Facebook at Daily Graphic and on YouTube and Twitter at GraphicGH.